All right, welcome back to another episode of A Path Unfolding. My guest here today is Chris Lung, AKA Left Right. He is a electronic music producer, a DJ. He has um, his own label, and you're putting on your own events, and you also make music, score music for television and film. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. Man. Yeah, man. You and I go way back, and I know you've moved out to Los Angeles, yeah. originally from Dallas. Um, you know, you've made an impact in my life. Uh, we've, we've hung out at Burning Man. You know, your songs are some of the ones that I go to when I'm DJing, when I'm trying to go into some of the darker, more melodic space. Love the breakbeats. Love what you're doing with your labels. Yeah, man. Well, let's get into it. I want to hear about Conduit and all you're doing with that. I know, you know, in the past you had another label called Broken. I know you did A&R for for Punk's label, yeah. and and I think I'm I'm curious to see this evolution. I'm, I know that you're putting on events around the United States, so yeah, let's dive in. Tell me about that. Totally, yeah. It's been it's been quite the journey. Uh, I've been producing quite a while since probably 2008. Yeah, and originally from Dallas, and uh, really, I think a, a lot of my focus was. Uh, a lot of the UK sounds. Yeah. In fact, I think some people still think I'm from the UK. <laughs> um, but yeah, when I was in Dallas, I really worked hard to kind of push the culture there. And I'm a, I'm a teacher as well, so I was really trying to teach and help engineer other uh, producers there. So you know, I can shout out some of the homies there: Eisenberg, Clarity, uh, Greed, um, Xander was someone I partnered with. Yeah. Uh, uh, with the label Broken. And uh, yeah, since I moved out here, uh, things have definitely shifted a little bit, and I'm starting to kind of branch off and do uh, some new stuff. So like you said, I started the uh, Conduit uh, right around <laughs> 2020, actually, <laughs> which is a bad time to start a uh, new like event and brand. Um, but did a few shows in Dallas, and now since I'm out here, now we're starting to do shows in different cities. And... Uh, Something we've always pushed really hard for with um, Conduit is we're real big on the art side. So mm -hmm. we really like doing art installations and we're trying to always collaborate with uh, visual artists for the stuff. So projection mapping, we like kind of techie stuff like that. And uh, lately we've been even getting into some of the experiential stuff. So nice. there's actually like stories at some of our events where you walk in and you kind of find out what's going on and then <laughs> go through different uh, stations and find out things that are happening in the story. So, nice. Yeah. Unlocking Something. bit by bit. Yep, totally. Does it, is there like a time or is it just like a story that you go, you go through it? Yeah. Well, we, yeah, it's really fun. I, I'm, it's been really fun to develop and, and also learn like what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah, some of the stories, you, you kind of get some info when you come in, but then you have to figure out where to go and do certain things. Uh, the one we're working on a lot right now is like this mineral mine. And so there's like stuff with uh, a mining corporation. It's kind of like novel fee. It's like sure. weird and fun, but... So you, I believe you had just had one in L.A., Yeah, right? we just had our first L.A. one, uh, yeah. which I, I'm super, super happy about, like... You know, LA is kind of a hard market to break into, especially with events, man. Like, like when we were trying to find ta like who we were gonna book, yeah. I'm like, oh, that person just played here last week. Uh, that person is playing here next month. Oh, this person has a hole in their date. I wonder why, Coachella. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's been pretty difficult. But for that show, we got to pair up with a really cool uh, record label here called Delusional Records, and they. Um, they're native LA. They just got nominated actually for Breakthrough Label by Mixmag, I think, last, last year. Nice. Great stuff. They were super, super cool. Uh, shout out to Mod Voss and Marie Nix. Uh, but yeah, I was trying to book um, some cool, uh, particularly LA talent, because as I've been here, I've been learning more about this scene mm -hmm. and, and what that's like. And as I started to like pick out people that I wanted to have play, I was like, oh, like half of these people are on delusional records. And okay. So, yeah, I hit them up and uh, wanted to see if they were interested in partnering, and they did, and it, w it was great. We had Board Lord came down from San Francisco, crushed her set. Yeah. Uh, and then also uh, Danny Gallagher, who I'm a big fan of. He's LA. He does a lot of engineering, I think, for uh, producers here. 
which is cool. It's kind of like what he seems kind of like what my role was like in Dallas. Nice. Like, like kind of engineering for a lot of people. And uh, another group I want to shout out to on the label is Canary Yellow. Uh, they're on my one of my favorite labels, Cloudcore. Uh, but uh, they're they're on the come up, and they, we've got a really strong single from them coming. So I'm I'm super hyped. Nice. Yeah. What's what's sort of your cadence and, and approach to the re- music release of the label? That's been <laughs> the hard part right now. Because yeah. it sounds, I mean, you're obviously doing a lot, right? And so right. how are you balancing the? those two things or three things yeah. yeah something that's been different for me is well and and you know i learned a lot about this with the label with broken uh working with uh, xander and eisenberg was really good because i think we all had our independent strengths that worked pretty well together and so now that i'm kind of doing my own thing i can see how much work it is trying yeah. to do uh the label and the events and my own art stuff and then also teaching and scoring and stuff um, so that's been the hard part is like trying to stay consistent so so far the label has still been mostly my stuff uh, but this is the year that we're about to uh, finally break out so we've got a, a cool compilation coming that I'm really s- stoked about um, some strong singles EP and, uh, and then I also have a remix album of my album that came out last year so you you put this album out last year, Big Rave Energy. <laughs> yeah. I love the name. <laughs> yeah, I and I mean, there's some phenomenal music on there, phenomenal moments. Let's talk about that because I mean, that, you, it's listed as your debut album. You had not put out an album yeah. before. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a scenario where, well, I think a lot of artists in 2020 were like, <laughs> "What am I going to do now?" Yeah, uh, figuring all that out. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it was around that time that I was like, "Well, I've got." I mean, I had already 12-ish tracks that were kind of sitting around that I didn't, I wasn't exactly sure how to put that together. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do the album. I mean, I've been producing quite a while at that point. I've never really done more than like a four-track EP. I was like, it's time. Like a lot of uh, standard advice is not to do that, especially yeah. for, you know, smaller, even some mid-range artists because I think, and, I mean, you can give me your opinion here too uh but i think the general advice sometimes is that you get more exposure if you're kind of releasing single 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 or smaller groups um but yeah i was like i've already been doing that i probably had 100 tracks out at this point (laughs) so i was like it's time let's do an album let's flex on it i went i went all in on it I i definitely put some money behind the promo pr and um you know i was running some ads and stuff and learned a lot and like I'm really happy with it. Yeah, like, like at at this point, some of that material is is all, a little older for me. I still love it, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm also excited about the new stuff that I'm working on now. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm really happy with how it went. Yeah. Like, well, what you said, you learned some things. What do you? Anything specific? Totally. Uh, well, so you know the like the PR game. That's always uh, a tough move because it can be pretty expensive mm-hmm. and. Uh, and sometimes you don't <laughs> get what you think. In fact, yeah. a lot of times you don't yeah. get what you think you're going to get. Um, and that I was worried that was going to happen, but at the end, I, I ended up getting some really good press um, across the board. Um, so that went pretty well. I did a radio campaign, and we did end up with uh, Gorgon City played uh, the title track on Radio One, which was cool. Huge. Um, and then the other thing that I learned is that. You know, just even running small little campaigns where you're just running videos with your music to people that don't know who you are. If you got a cool video and you got good music, you'll get some people to listen to your stuff. Yeah. So that was kind of cool. Um, you know, I'm not throwing tons of money behind it, but uh, even just little bits kind of, you know, like sometimes triggering the Spotify algorithm is like a thing. And yep. I definitely saw a movement there that I hadn't seen. I'm not, I'm not getting like, crazy plays i'm not yeah. i'm not in the millions yet but uh, <laughs> but yeah you know i'm i'm happy with how the album did i think it's around 350 400 thousand plays or something which i mean for a grouping of tracks that's certainly very good for me yeah <laughs> yeah like you said i mean the the sort of de facto advice is like do singles do eps but i'm i'm here to say go for your go for the gold like yeah if you have a story to tell and you're you're not 
creatively blocked and you've got music, that's, that's great. I mean, you're going to look back and always feel proud of that moment. And I think you have fans, you have people that actively listen to you. And I go look at YouTube and others, you know, social channels where people can comment, comment on what, what you're doing. People are excited about what you're doing. So for them to be able to dig in and listen more fully and have that full experience, yeah, that's fantastic. I think what you did with running ads is smart and PR. My advice on that is typically like you need to pick your punch and as an artist, know when the right time to do those things are, right. right? And have the right project. PR primarily relies on a story and having something. What is this about? Why is this interesting to talk about? If it's just another single, usually that's not going to go very far. The press outlet's like, well, what are we going to just write about another song? When there's an album and there's a concept there, that's, that's meaningful, that's valuable for a PR person that can really work with that. So that sounds smart. And also I want to shout out you because your video work has come so far I was you know as I was researching for this looking at what you're doing on that and just for anybody watching this these are Chris's cameras <laughs> he's you know kind of advising me on what we're doing here so like that's that's beautiful like you're you are such a renaissance man where you've taken whatever right and this is one of the hardest things about electronic music and being an independent artist these days is having to take on all these different roles and facets of being an artist and I've seen you really, you know, in my opinion, master a lot of these facets and really gone. So I think there's, you know, huge shout out to that. Mad, mad love. Um, so, yeah, and we'll be, you know, in, in, in these videos, we're going to be lacing it with some of your work so people can really awesome. see that. So yeah, if you're great. just listening, I encourage you to watch it because I think we put, we're definitely going to put some effort into that. Um, yeah, so let's, I mean, the, the interactive part of your parties, I think that's really exciting. You know, I've worked with Beats Antique, and and the guy that that was working with Beats Antique, be uh, before me and come brought me in as their manager. He he had a uh, an agency where they were doing experiential marketing, experiential yeah. activations, right? So a brand like Adidas or or whatever would come in and hire them to put together to something. And it's sort of the new frontier of marketing and engagement. People come in and they have some sort of they're part of it, right? Which I think both of you, you and I love Burning Man, and that to me was what changed the game. Is like I felt like I was part of what was happening there. You're encouraged to be part of it. Yeah. So that seems like such an evolution. I'm glad that you're taking that on and putting into that. I'm I'm excited to see. Hopefully, I can make it to one of the events yeah. <laughs> sometime soon. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, and we're also experimenting with it. We're trying to find that right balance too of like commercial versus underground. That's mm. been kind of a f well, it's actually been one of the big shifts that's been happening for me, particularly since moving here, is I think when I was uh, really pushing strong in, in, you know, the maybe few years before 2020, um, I, you know, had manager and agent and was pushing real hard to get on more commercial stages and get on bigger and bigger labels. And, yep. uh, you know, I was happy with the decisions we made and, like, got on like Mousetrap and In Rotation, that's Insomniac's label. Um, and like Bite This uh, was Jaws's label and a few, few other big ones. And I was working a lot with punks at the time. But now uh, I, my focus is really, I'm not trying to stair step mm -hmm. much, uh, or at least not in that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now I'm really just trying to build um, conduit as a thing where we can just be creative and do whatever the hell we want you know what yes. I mean and so I don't have to worry about oh is this housey enough or not housey enough for this label or is this fit like whatever the trend is uh, you know now I'm kind of trying to do things just on my own terms it's a little more work uh, yeah. you know uh, because I may not be working with some of the larger networks I was before but I'm kind of building my own now yeah. And, and also like trying to bring people in with me and uh, lift them up, like bringing in a lot of students that are helping me with stuff and um, yeah, having them release on the label and um, yeah, and ha having them play the events and we're all promoting together and it's, yeah. it's coming together. That's been a big shift for me though. <laughs> like it's kind of like I'm like developing teams in a way. Yeah. And now I'm like I've always been a very like I do this and then if people can help me like you know like a manager or an agent then I'm just going to keep doing my mm -hmm. whatever this is and now I, I I just can't do it all and so I'm I'm really learning how to 
I guess it's like a leadership role. I don't absolutely. <laughs> I don't really consider myself that, but uh, yeah, I'm just trying to learn how to work with larger groups of people, which is also very new to me. Yeah. Like, you know, I've got to deal with uh, yeah, everyone's got different ideas, and then and, and how do I hone those together without uh, and make, making sure that we're all feeling like we're contributing mm-hmm. and and yet there's still cohesion to yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> And that's that's new to me, but it's a cool challenge. It's been a lot of fun to um, take that on, really. Yeah, there's growth. Yeah, I mean, I resonate with that, obviously, with Gravitas. I mean, that was one of the underlying, you know, the ethos of the label was this creative collective. Everybody had an opportunity to participate as the label has evolved and we've had success. And, you know, we've worked with people like Closing of the Trees and sort of built that name it's it's been tough because you do you do need a strong figurehead you do need someone in the center sort of steering the ship obviously like you said we can't do it all i can't do it all it's so important to bring people on and make sure that they are getting something out of that participation they're learning a skill they're getting you know to that next step in their career and then also they're helping you build your vision and you know, I, I read in your newsletter that you have this manifesto, and I, I thought that was so cool to have taken the time to sit down and really craft this idea, so that you you were clear on it, right? So there's so many right. times where I haven't been clear on what I was really trying to do, and the more clarity I have, the more better I can communicate to my team. Why is this important? What is? Why does this matter? Um, what are we trying to do? The other thing I, thought, I think that's really important about what you're doing is like all of these labels that you named and other artists that have supported you and all that. To me, that's great, and it's amazing when you get those wins, but it comes and it goes, and it's pretty fast, and and it feels like these cycles of that go faster and faster every day. it's crazy. And now you're building a brand, and you're building your house, you know, and nobody can really take that away from you. You still have to feed the fire, and it's the creative fuel, you know, but you're building this team, and now people can see this opportunity. And as you bring new artists into that, right, you're getting the mind share as your fans discover these new artists and go, whoa, that's amazing. You sort of get credit for that. And that, that lifts you up even further, which is super smart, right? That, 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 and then you start to really have this collective vision and, and team. When it becomes bigger than you and things are happening that you're not even aware of, that is like that's the moment where you're like, wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I am kind of you know thinking about my long term. Yeah, I like that you said that because that is a thing where even La Fright, my main artist alias, is starting to take a little bit of a backseat. Yeah, and I'm going to be pushing conduit harder than I'm going to be pushing really? myself. Okay. Yeah, that is actually a goal. Yeah, because it's also a longevity thing. You right. know, like. Um, I don't want to be touring forever. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm also just like a kind of a stressy. Uh, ner- I'm, believe it or not, I'm a little bit of a nervous performer, and so nonstop touring. I mean, I was never like touring like crazy, crazy, but yeah. it was enough where I was like, Whoo. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I like to keep it to you know one one or two a weekend max, and and not do a bunch of big strings. And so that's been nice because now I can. I'm choosing to do things on my own terms, whereas you know when you're in the machine, <laughs> that makes it sound like a the man or something. Yeah, I, I but there, I mean, it's it is. You're trying to you're trying to you know keep up with the demand and hit those markets and you know see those fans and make that impression and the turnover in the scene, right? As a as a performer, a live performer, a DJ, a touring DJ. The turnover is like almost every year, every two years, maybe four years, and these are kids, you know, in college, and they're having their formative years, and then right. making that bond with your music, and then as they age out, like, you know, what happens? So it, it's it can be really tricky. So a lot of the big things that we're trying to focus on for Conduit is what I sat down and I was like, this is kind of fun to talk about, actually. Yeah. Like, what is the purpose of your life? So I, I saw, I mean, I probably saw it on a TikTok or something. Yeah. Some shit. But I was like, TikTok or not, I was like, wow, that's a, that's a pretty good question for me to think about. Yeah. And I, I can't remember what, everything they said in the video, but they were like, well, that's a pretty hard question to ask yourself. So kind of break it in, break it down 
to at the end of your life, what do you want to know that you've done? Mm. What kind of things? And so I thought about that. And for myself, and that kind of informed this manifesto because I want conduit to be these things, is mm. I want to make art because I, I, d- I definitely think that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. Like since I was a kid, I've just been wanting to learn stuff and make stuff. And, and it's very on the art side. I'm not as good with uh, mechanical stuff yeah. quite as much as I am art. I like visual art. I like music. So I want to make art. So that's number one. I want to have some fun doing it. I want to work with cool people and, you know, and like yourself yeah. and, and uh, other cool artists and building community. And then I also want to leave the world a better place. I know that's cliche as hell. It's not. It's not. <laughs> but I want the things that we're doing yeah. there to a be contributing to a better world, and also not just parties. Uh, you know, par- parties are great, and I'm glad that we all enjoy them. But you know, obviously, in the music and the art is cool. But we are trying to donate some of our funds to charities, mm. like uh, our last release and <laughs> the. Conduit Chaos Contraption. <laughs> it, uh, we donated 100% of that. I mean, it was like we only had it up for a week, but got a couple hundred bucks out of it. Nice. And uh, giving that to charity. And uh, I also want to be trying to do some service stuff, which I think is a lot harder for people to get behind. It's a lot harder to do, but I want that to be a part of my ethos and a part of the label's ethos. And I want people who are involved to know that. So that's kind of what was behind that newsletter and that like manifesto beautiful yeah it's not cliche i mean i think if we all figure out how to tie our passions and our skills into something that has some element of leaving the world a better place i mean there's you know you still have to feed yourself you still have to you know you still need to satisfy yourself you know uh, spiritually you know artistically but then having some note of that, it really helps. I mean, I'll, I'll share that we've had success with Gravitas in doing compilations for charity, which you've, you've been a part of. We've raised money for DEF CON, yeah. or the, actually the EFF, which you know, they support online privacy. We've done charities that help you know, for ALS, ALS research. Um, and Charity Water, which is one of my most favorite uh, charities in the world. And... What's cool about that, and it's a little bit of a hack, and it's not like we went into it with that idea, but it opens the doors. When you're leading with, we're doing this for this cause, and this is why this cause is important, it's less selfish, it's less self-centered, and you can get people on board that may be a little bit above your you know, pay grade or your level or where you are in whatever you're doing, because they're like, okay, I want to contribute to that. And that really helped Gravitas in the early days, like, build network and show people that we were serious about what we were doing. The other part of that is we really did we really did take it seriously. We brought fully formed marketing plans and how this was going to work and the timeline and what we were looking for and that the rights would you know if for any reason the artist could have the rights back to those songs if they you know wanted it at any time and really came correct. Really like in a year one label I thought that was that was really helpful. So I'm glad to hear you say that and I don't think it's cliche. I think we should be asking people to do that more and more like you know the i think when we step outside of ourselves and we go a little deeper and we go bigger and we have a bigger vision that involves more of us that some way that's going to going to happen so i love it man i'm excited to see that it's a good way to change things you know? yeah 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 and on that tip like you mentioned you're a teacher i mean that's that's the other it's really you know person by person song by song you know, day by day is how we build our life. You mentioned that story of your life. Like, I, I love that. I think about how, when I'm on my deathbed, what is the story of my life that I want to leave and, and be able to be, look back and be proud of? And so whenever I go after something, that's one of the ways that I frame that. It's like, yeah. hey, is this going to be meaningful? It's a good check. Yeah. You know? Like, how am I going to feel Sitting about on the this? couch watching Netflix is not something we're going to th- remember. Right. But, Starting a podcast, starting a label, starting an event, doing something for charity are things that we can write home about. Yeah, so. yeah I agree. That's great. Yeah. That's cool. I'm glad you uh, brought that up. Yeah, tell me, tell me about how long have you been teaching? What does that look like? What, what all facets of, are you mainly teaching music production? Are you teaching all sorts of facets of music? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I've been teaching quite a while also, I think. 
I think I was starting to teach college in uh, maybe 2011 or 2012, like okay. quite, quite a while ago, um, at a little community college in uh, Plano, Texas. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I was teaching audio engineering there, so that's kind of how I started. Um, I think essentially when I got out of college, and I think people may want to know, like a lot of people, kids, when they're learning to produce and they're getting out of school, whether it's high school or college, they're, they're like, well, now what? Yeah. <laughs> and so in my case, I, um, I was like, I'll do anything as long as it's in music. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I ended up taking odd jobs. I ended up working with a promotion company or promoter in Dallas. Uh, shout out Jeremy Word. We're still very good friends. Oh, Jeremy, yes. Yeah, we talk every week. Uh, I mean, he is as OG as they come. Yeah, he's been a huge mentor to me, wow. actually. And we're, we're really, really good friends. Uh, we talk all the time now. But yeah, at that time, he was like the, the biggest electronic promoter in Dallas. So I was firing cars, man. Like that was my job was I was just putting flyers on cars and promoting shows. But I learned how to promote. You know, I learned, you know, <laughs> how to really get out there and what it took to promote shows back in that day. Yeah. And then I was doing random audio jobs and I got to a point where, yeah, I was already starting to mix and master for people. And then I started to uh, teach at the college. And um, you, the really cool thing about teaching is you learn twice as much. Mm. <laughs> like, and I, I think teaching has really made me humble, uh, more humble in a lot of ways because you think you know stuff when you're teaching and then you realize there's always more to learn and mm. the things you really thought you knew or er, er, the, the older I get, the more I know I don't know. You know? <laughs> um, That's a good sign. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, yeah. And since then I really started to, after I left the college because the touring was starting to get a little crazy, like the first week of college I was always Burning Man <laughs> oh, and wow. I was missing the first day every, every year. <laughs> And the, and, and the subs, substitutes were telling people that I was at Burning Man. I was like, why are you telling them? <laughs> They're just going to razz me about it. And they did, of course. Well, it gives you street cred. It did. Like, yeah. Probably give me some <laughs> What'd you learn cred. out there? <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, had, I did have to stop the college thing for a while because of the, the touring was getting a little intense. And then I really started to settle into doing more one on one, either engineering sessions or like student, uh, like teaching production. And that eventually turned into a lot more of just artist development, mm -hmm. too. So obviously helping them produce songs, giving them feedback on that and learning whatever in the music side of things, production, sound design, um, you know, theory. But, uh, but also trying to get them, you know, to have uh, some branding and a visual aesthetic and, mm -hmm. you know, how to promote yourself and the social media game and how to shop to labels and all that. Uh, and I, I just, I like all of it, and I like working with other people. Mm -hmm. And I would say one of the greatest joys in my life with, in teaching, because when I was a younger artist, I was like, I don't want to teach. I don't, that's not, I want to be an artist, and I only want to do artist stuff. But I have really changed my mind. I really enjoy having teaching be a, a portion of my life because it gets me out of my head. Mm. And all of the things that I get crazy, every, all artists get crazy about stuff. I don't know anybody immune to it. You know what I mean? Not a single person. We all, we're trying to do stuff. And when you're trying to do stuff, you care. Mm -hmm. And then when you care and things don't go the way you want, you're going to, it sucks. And yeah. that, that's just life. And when you're an artist, you tend to care. <laughs> yeah. Um, and teaching has helped me l get more objective I, because I can be objective with my students. It's helped me learn how to be more objective about myself because things I'll be pissed about, <laughs> a student will come in with the same problem and I'll be like, oh no, it's okay. This is how it goes, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, shit, I should <laughs> follow my own advice. You know Love I mean? that. <laughs> uh, so that's been really, that's really been great about teaching is it really helps me stay grounded and um, <laughs> not go a little too cuckoo with my own projects and stuff like that. So yeah, I love that part of it. Yeah. You talked about the branding piece, and I, I love all the brands that you have and sort of yes. the aesthetic that you bring. Have, did you do any formal studying or that? That's just all self-taught. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm, it's, I'm very kind of you to say that because like graphic design is like where I really am trying to get better, and I'm, I'm still not quite there. Huh. I have 
clearly I've definitely had some help with, uh, with some of the brands and some of the logos and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, finding something very uh, striking or recognizable, I think is just part of what I like visually. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always pursuing that. Uh, like the conduit logo is still like it's constantly evolving little by little and uh, like if you pay close attention you'll start to see little changes and, <laughs> but we're about I think we're about to be finished with that I'm actually working with a really great uh, designer uh, in the bay uh, she goes by her, her, she's a great uh, DJ and she's learning production too uh, Felly Fell and she goes uh, Fell Designs is a uh, the stuff that she does, but she's helping me kind of finish up the conduit brand, and I'm nice. I'm pretty stoked about it. Yeah, this is an obvious question, but like, why do you think that branding is so important? Like, and I think that's again, I'm kind of like uh, it's a, a softball, but I think there's a lot to dig in there. Like, totally. Yeah. Well, I think I do think making a, a a visual impact. I mean, it's just something I'm always drawn to. It's what draws me to photography and videography and color I'm like getting really obsessed with. Uh, but I think, and I, I've seen other people talk about it too, it, it becomes part of your identity, mm -hmm. uh, like brand identity I guess is like the, the buzz term for it. But it does help people kind of become familiar with you in a way, you know. Uh, so having something kind of striking but then also something where people are like, oh, I see that and I know what that is mm -hmm. and that's cool. Or like mm -hmm. I'm a, you know. And I think what a lot of, fans or maybe consumers don't realize is that if you do it right, it's happening all the time and they're, you're always seeing little bits of that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know and, and maybe it's even a little cheesy, but like in a lot of the videos I shoot in my studio, kind of left right's identity is mostly uh, black, and, black and white, not the photography per se, I've actually gotten a lot more colorful in the years, but uh, this blue or more like cyan and reddish look and so even in my shots at, at home, I actually have a, blue, a light blue and red light that's kind of on either side of me. Um, I was kind of a, became kind of a trendy photography thing, but mm -hmm. I do it a little more subtly where you can just kind of tell. But I'm doing little things like that that I, I'm not sure people would notice most of the time, but there's little hints of that. And I think, I feel this way about music too, like sound design and stuff. There are things that you can do that actually are unconscious, like they... People absorb it, but they, it's not always conscious. And I think, I think that's just part of art too. You know, yeah. just like this is a statement. This is kind of the look. This is the thing. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's important because I think it sets you you apart. Like you know, it can be very striking, and and then also, you know, you're kind of creating a, a voice for mm -hmm. yourself that I, I think is cool. What what do you think? Like, what's your exploration been? Like? I mean, I think all everything you said is great. One of the things that I think is important to understand about brand is that it's a promise, yeah, visual promise for the most part. And then sonically, for you, and I think you do a great job with it. You deliver on that promise. You're Absolutely. matching the visual aesthetic with the music, and the more that those connect, and it and it and it circles back like the artwork and the logo and then the music and it all starts to really feel cohesive that's where the magic happens and that's where it, it's it's difficult and it takes time yeah. and it takes it's like this piece of marble and you're chipping away at it and for you even right as the founder or the owner of this brand or the you know the steward of it you're trying to discover it in for yourself so it's never finished never complete it's a living breathing thing but when it's working and it's connecting and people can see just that one logo and then know kind of what to expect, they may still be surprised, which is the art part, but they're like, okay, I trust it, right? There's this trust and you continue to deliver on that promise. Then it's like, you're starting to really, that's why it's so valuable. You have brands like Apple that are, you know, what are probably a trillion dollar brand, right? Yeah. They've delivered on their promise, you know, for all the Apple haters, whatever. There's other, <laughs> other, you know, other brands too, but they've consistently delivered on, you know, good quality technology products that help you do the thing you're trying to do. And it starts to become bigger than just that little thing that it is. And that's, that's exciting to me. That's why with my web agency, when we do branding, I coach some of my clients around that. I don't know. I think when we start from that place, they start to understand why it's so important to start with brand in the whole process. Because you don't have that, then you don't know anything. We don't even know what we're trying to say yet. The brand is defining all of those pieces. So it's really important as an artist 
you know, or, or a business or whatever you're, you're taking on and trying to create in the world, even in your own personal brand, to, to take time to really figure that out for yourself or write things down. What does this mean? What does it not mean? Who is my intended audience is another really big question that as you start to refine that, then you can start to use language and ideas that connect with the intended audience where you can get more specific and more clear with them if your intended audience is audio engineers, you can start to use technical terms that other people wouldn't. Right. Right. And totally. That that's fun. That's cool, and it it helps you. Like I said, it's kind of like connects with what you were saying about teaching. It helps you get more clarity. It helps you get like the more you dive into the brand, the more you realize this is not that brand, and this is that brand. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I kind of want to ask you because I'm do, I'm both. I'm always having. I'm always shifting, right? That's, yeah. that's also part of it, right? Is you're always kind of developing and like maybe trying to hit a new audience uh-huh. or attract a new uh, voice or something like that. Um, I'm curious, like, how has that work? Have, how has that worked for you? Like, have you ha- ever had a big logo change or or like decided to change how you were doing the art? A couple times, yeah. I mean, when we first launched Gravitas, it was gold and black, uh-huh. and then that color in particular was just somewhat challenging. So we did go to sort of the more traditional black and white. I mean, when designing a logo, I, I tell people like, you need to start with black and white. Yeah. Don't introduce color. It needs to look good small, it needs to look good big. Yeah. And we also, and I made some of those mistakes with the, the first Gravitas uh, logo, and it was too complicated, it was too busy, I had too many things going on with it. And as we refined it, we stripped things away, and we kept what we thought were the essence and the, the fundamentals of the logo, the brand. We did do like, you know, updated some of the fonts, say, okay, this is what the fonts we're going to use. As we started to look into artwork, I mean, when we first launched the, the label, 2011, 2012, like, I had no idea what I was doing. Straight up. I was just wanting to have fun. Just yeah. like you. I want to work with cool people. I sense. want to support artists. I want to put music out. I want to be part of this scene. And now I'm just going to go for it. And very quickly, I made a big mess. And I signed way too many artists. I had way too much stuff in the pipeline. I wasn't had enough attention to detail. The mixing and the mastering was all over the place. When John Bircham, Symbionic, came onto the label, he had a lot more experience with some of those you know, details because he was releasing his own music. And also, he's more of a detail person. And I started to learn that about my personality, that I'm an, an idea person. I am a leader. I'll get people fired up to go do something, but I very much need people to help me <clears throat> kind of deliver on that vision. And as I've leaned into that, it's really helped me understand who I am and, and who I need to work with. So that was that. And then as we really started to look at the artwork of the label, we found some key artists that we thought really met our aesthetic and our vision and would deliver artistically you know, uh, on the, the artwork for the, the whatever we were releasing would match the quality of the music. And so that, that was really fun. One woman in particular who we didn't work with her that often, but her name is Joyce Sue. She just worked on Tool's last album. She did some of the, some of the artwork for that. I have a signed poster from her, uh, all of the members of Tool, plus her signature from one of the you know, first uh, uh, dates on the most recent album. So that, that has been amazing. She's gone on to work for Apple and do all sorts of stuff, and, and she did a lot of the Glitch Mobs early artwork, and, and, and um, she's just phenomenally talented. So that was, to, to me, too, like um, being able to work with other artists was such a fun experience to learn from them, and, and you know, in some ways, it's, I kind of feel like I'm saying this poorly, but you absorb some of their power. You know, they were making us look really good. Yeah. You know, and so that that was fun. Um, and, and I guess to your question, I mean, I think we have it pretty dialed. I, I would say our brand's pretty wide, and I think that's too. It goes along with the music. I mean, for Gravitas releasing anything from like sometimes heavy dubstep to more down tempo trip hop, or even sometimes like more organica house, and it's it's been a journey to ex, like expand it and go, okay, we can play in that musical sandbox too. And I think maybe there, there's, you know, pros and cons and there's been some like, you know, people that maybe have like lost uh, or we've lost them along the way. 
But I have always had the vision of being more like a ninja tune or warp records. I don't think we're there in any way. But that was like, I don't really care. I don't want to get so hyper focused on a genre. I just want it to be intelligent, emotional, moving music cool. with quality, you know, music, electronic music production. That was sort of the, that was my qualifier for what we would work for. Uh, I want to kick that question back to you. How has your branding changed over the years and how, how are you thinking about that now? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's definitely been. I mean, I, it's funny. Like when it was happening, I never, I didn't really realize that 2020 was a big shift for me. I was just kind of like doing whatever I had to do at that time. Like a big, a big shift for me was, uh, you know, I, I was meeting everyone in person at my studio, and then I, I had to shift to doing like Zoom sessions. Uh, and at that time, it was out of my apartment because I wasn't even. There were some other things going down with the studio. And um, yeah, that was actually kind of how I started to get into scoring. But yeah, of all the things that started to change, I did start to change a little bit my, my look. So you, you would probably remember that there was a time where I didn't show my face at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In fact, like I would show up to gigs and people didn't, didn't know. <laughs> I mean, they could usually recognize the hat because I've been doing that for quite a while. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they didn't know what my <laughs> face looked like because I was always in shadow. And I kind of heard from a variety of people, I, you might have even been part of that conversation that, uh, you, you know, people, when they're connecting to an artist, they do kind of want to see who you are. And I'm, although I like that shadowy aesthetic, I'm not really like a dark, scary person. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a shift for me. And I was, I think I was kind of worried about how that would go. But, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just try to be genuine with all my stuff. And, and I think, I think that's, uh, I'm able to share stories now and I can talk to the camera, mm-hmm. which that took a while. I was looking at some like <laughs> super cringe videos uh, <laughs> the first time I was trying to talk to the camera. It was pretty bad. Uh, but yeah, I've been enjoying that. And, and I think that's some advice I try and give to students and other artists is that <laughs> one of your big jobs as an artist is connecting to the people that like your music. Like it's, it might be one of the, I mean, besides making art that you love, connecting with the people that are wanting to support you is really important. And I think figuring out how to communicate, you know, whether it's socials or newsletters or just your branding and -hmm. and how you're, all of that communication, conscious or unconscious, is is something to, to work on and be paying attention to. So that was a learning experience for me was, yeah, I can... I think maybe because I, I don't sometimes like to be the center of attention per se. Yeah. Like I don't like being on a stage with a big spotlight on me. Like I don't like that. I'd much rather be playing cool shit like in the corner or whatever. Um, that's more my vibe. But but yeah, just come coming out of my shell a little bit and learning how to communicate and just uh, yeah show my face a little. Yeah. Bit. Once again, <laughs> I mean, I I did see that shift in you. I think the the shadow aesthetic worked really well, and I and I think we did have a conversation about like it, you kind of paint yourself into a corner a little bit. You limit your options, and yeah, I think it's it's good to see you out there. I think your you know your music is still delivering on that promise, but now you have all these other avenues where you're sharing thoughts. I think one video that I really recently saw was like the maybe the top five or ten. Uh, you know, sort of UK breaks. Yeah. And I really thought that was great. One, it just showed your ability to transition and your mixing skills and you kind of like actually sitting there with the CDJs and hitting that. And the and and then just paying homage to and, and, and understanding these emerging genres and things that are you know happening musically for you and what's what's resonating with you. I think that's an I know it wasn't an easy piece of content, but it was like cool, you know, and it didn't necessarily all have to come from you like this is the thing I'm doing, and this is my album, and it you know it shows a lot, a lot. You know, you're kind of bringing in community there. So I, I thought that was that was great, and, and and yeah, you're like you're also like clearly working on your video skill, and so much of the way that we're connecting with artists is through these phones and these screens. So whether we like it or not, it's sort of the way to do it, and people, you know, are. This is where we're learning to, uh, you know, connect with people. So I'm, I'm glad to see you have moved into that phase, and and like everything else, like taking it seriously, getting 
getting good at it, which is is no small feat, right? Yeah, it, like it said, takes a lot of failures. Is what yeah, it takes. <laughs> talking to the camera. If no one's ever done it, it's yeah. really hard. Yeah, it's, it's really it's, weird. It's not as easy as, it, as <laughs> no. it seems like it would be. Yeah, <laughs> many takes later, you might go on. <laughs> it was so funny watching this video too. It was so cringy. I was like, oh my god. Well, and I see other artists do it too because everyone's trying to figure out. Yeah, like, I mean. The, the algorithm, yeah, the holy algorithm <laughs> that we're all trying to serve, whatever, whatever is that part of society is. Yeah, but you're trying to do something. Obviously, theoretically, the algorithm is to connect you with people, but also it favors certain things. Mm-hmm. And if you're not doing whatever the thing is that it's is going to help you, then yeah. So it's like also constantly updating how you're right, whatever that thing is. Yeah, my take on that is one like make those algorithms work for you right. we don't work for them yeah. if we're stuck on that that like treadmill of i've got to make content it's going to feel bad it's yeah. not going to be fun yeah. right that's true <laughs> and the other what i think part of this podcast is like you can use long form content and then make small form content from that so your lift your effort to make something is a good bit to do something long, but then you can chop it up and reuse it and repurpose it. I think that's one of the things that I'm saying that's really good. And you, you know, there's all these different ways that you can do that. And then find what works for you inside of that. Like, what do you, what, what is the content that you like, or what is the thing that you want to put out there? Like, you don't have to do Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, you know, all these different things. Like, find one that works for you. And then lean into that. That would be my advice, and something that cool. you know I'm trying to, to to take that as well. So it's not every platform all the time, every day. That'll make you crazy. That'll burn you yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm <laughs> I'm in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm with you there. That's good. I think that's really good advice too. Yeah. yeah. It's finding finding what works, but that way you like to do because that is the thing about. The algorithm is like it over like it, once you do that one thing, then it wants you to keep doing that. Yeah. And then sometimes you can get kind of stuck doing that. Yep. Uh, and then I think if anything, that's been a detriment to me because I, I immediately don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over. Yeah. So but I, I like making new stuff all the time. So yeah. that's it's always an adventure and it's fun. It's fun for sure. Let's talk about composing music for television and film. Yeah. Has moving out to LA helped with that? You feel like you're more in the world. Or it's kind of just been evolving as you've been getting better at it. I uh, that that's a good question. So uh, yeah, I started to kind of get into it accidentally. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a pretty awesome story actually. <laughs> I uh, I had always avoided doing a lot of creative stuff like that for for like paid jobs mm-hmm. because I'd had a, like some very light experience with it. And I think at that time I was still a little bit, uh, this is when I was pretty young, like I was kind of fresh out of school. And they would give you feedback and say, hey, no, we want something like this or something like that. And when you're kind of a young artist, I, I see a lot of people are like this. You're like, don't tell me how to make my art. Like I made this. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me why it should be like this because I made it to be the way I want it to be. And... I, I think that's an okay mentality to have about your own art, and that's fine. But if you are working with other people to create a larger vision, then yeah, you may need to work with a director. You may need to work with uh, uh, an agency or people. And sometimes that's kind of annoying, <laughs> having too many uh, people in the kitchen. Too many cooks in the ki- kitchen can sometimes not make the soup very good. <laughs> yeah, but. Um, but it is a reality of creating larger visions. I mean, movies are like that. You yeah. have to have lots of people working on it, and it can't just only be uh, one idea. Like you need to pull in expertise from other, other places. So I think after I'd matured a little bit, and then 2020 happened, uh, I'd actually met <laughs> this really cool director from Tokyo at Burning Man. <laughs> he was wearing a crazy costume, and we just met him like 3 a.m. at a crazy camp. And I, somehow or another, we ended up following each other. And I was like, wow, this director is like making some really awesome stuff. Mm. And just hollered at him. And we, he was like, oh, we would love to have your music on something. And then we just started working on stuff and like landed some pretty big stuff like immediately, like Anitsuka Tiger, which is like a shoe brand. But uh, like we did a, like a Nike thing through an agency, uh, Yamaha, like. Some pretty big ones. Yeah. Urban Decay, which is like a make, pretty big makeup brand. 
Um, and that was cool because like I got to work with someone who obviously I knew was cool. And because I'd matured enough at that point to learn how to take f- f- feedback and, and direction, uh, then, oh, and the other reason I learned how to do that so well is teaching. Because when I would sit down with students, I'm like, what do you want to make? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'd try and help, help them make that like fast, like in you know, an hour or two, as quick as we can. And I just got really used to doing that over and over and over right. and over, like day in and day out. So when I started to work with a director or a creative agency and they're like, here's the idea, here's the brief, I'm like, great, let's go. <laughs> yeah. And I could do it really fast because I, you know, that's something I always felt, a, it's probably an internalized pressure is when I'm working with students. Like I want to get them the best thing that they can as quickly as possible. And so I got really fast. <laughs> so yeah, some of these briefs for ads and stuff like that, a lot of the stuff I've been doing is ads. And it'll be, or trailers mm-hmm. and for films and stuff like that. It's like a 24 or 48 wow. hour turnaround. And they're like, we need music now. I don't fully understand why it's like that in the industry, but it's super common that you don't have more than a few days. But my last 10 years of teaching has really prepared me to do that. So as soon as I started doing that, uh, that started to go really well and linked up with another licensing agency uh, doing similar stuff and trailers. Um, yeah, you don't land everything that you pitch on. So you're doing briefs sometimes. And like I've pitched on some pretty cool movie trailers and stuff. I, I didn't land everything, but landed some pretty big game things like um, <laughs> EA Sports uh, NHL. I did a remix of Justice, uh, Waters of Nazareth. Wow. <laughs> it's like a huge. That's huge. I mean, to, yeah, you and I know. Like, yeah. That's, that's a huge song. Uh, and I got the stems and everything. You wow. Know? So, and then the other one was The Who, uh, uh, Teenage Wasteland, uh, ba- or Baba O'Reilly is the actual name of the song. Teenage Wasteland. And I had um, Action Bronson was rapping on it. Wow. Yeah, so some pretty cool lands. Uh, like, and I did the mix and the master on it and everything, so I'm getting his vocals and stuff. So pretty weird combo of uh, sounds there, but it was those projects are really fun to work on because it's like it's a creative puzzle like I'm I'm really into making music to me is like solving puzzles Mm. it's like how to create a statement and then how do you make that statement last and evolve vary it and evolve it and um, yeah a lot of making art is like solving cool creative puzzles Mm. so I really like that aspect of uh, of scoring, yeah, it's really fun. Talk more about that. That's, that like definitely piques my interest. So, you, when you're writing, sitting down, or any sort of creative art, you're thinking about it as a puzzle. You're thinking about it as kind of finding the centerpiece or finding the starting point, and then you're building around that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, like most musicians, probably, like when you're initially writing something, you are just trying to write a hook or something like something you love that mm-hmm. like the way it sounds or you could start from sound design or whatever but i think once you have that your main whatever your main statement is your hook or your drop or uh you know if i'm scoring for something maybe it's a theme well then you've got to make it work over however long the duration is uh you know if it's a song structure you got to make it work with the song structure and invariably you run into little problems like oh well the energy is a little too low here or in scoring, the director might say, hey, we need, um, this is a little too bombastic, let's take it down, or way more likely, we need this to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? Like it, <laughs> that's the most common note, is like, this isn't crazy enough. Yeah. Like, more risers. More impacts. Crap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, how many <laughs> risers can we add? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, but it's solving puzzles. And, and what's really funny about this creative stuff I'm also like a chess fan. So speaking of like puzzles, I like, you know, sometimes you're working with, I'm, I'm the composer, right? But I'll be working with the director mm-hmm. and they have a vision. The client has a vision. Mm-hmm. And then the creative agency might also have a different vision. And so I might get notes from all three and they sometimes conflict. And then I have to balance. Oh. <laughs> now that's not how it's supposed to happen. Like usually they're supposed to narrow it down. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I know that I got to please the client and please the director at the same time and uh you know i think for the most part the 
believe it or not, the director is way more important because they're creating the vision, and sometimes the client doesn't know how cool what the director is right. doing, but they will sometimes veto stuff. Mm. So I have to keep keep track of that stuff. So that's that's another like way I have to kind of be playing chess there mm. um, with how to solve what the client wants and maybe what the other creative team wants, and also what I think is going to work best for yeah. achieving what they want emotionally or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I'm very interested in the sometimes friction between business, money, and creativity, and finding a way as an artist to make those things work. And I think there's there's you know one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast and ask these questions because I've seen so many people do different variations. Right, you're doing teaching, you've got your label, you're DJing, you're doing commercial television and film, and like you're making your life work like that, right? And so it sounds like you have a healthy relationship with money and creativity, but there's have do you relate to what I'm saying about that? Uh, like yes. The, well, I think if you, I'm I'm not starved of starved of artistic mm. freedom, <laughs> so it doesn't scare me to work on an ad or something where maybe they're asking me to do some things that I wouldn't do normally artistically, but that's because. It's a creative puzzle that I'm doing for them, Got it. and that's fine. But I, I'm out putting all kinds of crap that I want to do <laughs> at any day, any Got time. It. I yeah. think that's maybe that is a, or an earlier artist moment where you had that moment, but now you have developed your own artistic path, and you know that's there. You're secure in it, so now you're okay to come play in somebody else's sandbox and have fun with that. Totally, and I'm, I'm for the most part, I'm working with. People I, I like, and I'm, you know, if I get a brief for an ad I don't want to work on, I'm just not going to do it. You yeah. Know what I mean? It just comes to mind like trying to get Kanye to do something. Like he would probably not be so amenable, right? <laughs> probably not. But it's not like he's immune to brands, you know, he's, yeah. he's trying to do brands all over the place. Absolutely. Too. Yeah, it's, I think it's fun. And I mean, uh, there's also some, a lot of the cameras I bought was because. You know, I'm working in those those side of the creative fields. Is you know, sync and uh, fi- film and video. There there is there's a lot of money for music on that side. Mm-hmm. That's kind of hard to get. You know, on the record label side. Oh, hundred well, percent. Yeah. Have it, so I was curious because like I've started to move in the sync world. Yeah. Sync is synchronization to video and film. For yeah. people That don't know that term, but. Um, I've been starting to do more sync, and even our label started to get some sync stuff. Oh, good. How, how has that worked for you? It's good. We've had it's some. Hard, right? Yeah, it's hard. It's as the industry has developed, right? There's more people that are just writing for television and film. So and you might get less looks for an unknown artist, but we've had some really good success. So one of the artists that I've championed is a group called Baseline Drift. And we signed them with a Riptide Music Group that's out here in Los Angeles. Yeah. And they've been very good to us. And they, they understand the, the industry. They get the briefs. They have the, the relationships with you know, the movie houses and the trailer houses and all of that. And they also will take you know, certain songs, specifically with Baseline Drift, that they know they, that has the, the core sound that they're looking for and then they'll have some of their in-house producers go and do remixes put the impacts and the drops make them trailer ready so that's kind of that example of like you might have a really good idea but then if you're working with a a sync agency they might take your songs and ready them for sync so it's been a lot to learn yeah but you know we've had we've had some good uh, we've had like a couple Netflix things uh, Apple um, some you know some proper like movie trailers specifically, and this one song just keeps getting. Nice. I think something that people might not know is like as you sync a song, it becomes more valuable, and it oftentimes will get resynced because it has a, a, a case study or somebody who's like, look, it's been used here, that works well, right? And so let's use it here. So that's cool. Um, you know when we were. It was probably this was before the pandemic. So this was like nineteen eight, you know, two thousand eighteen, two thousand nineteen. It was working with Riptide, hearing the trends. Oh, like hip hop's super popular right now. Or you know, do you have a song that's like you know 
uh, Stomp, Clap, Hey, which is a, you know like the Lumineers type thing. Those were doing really well. Yeah. So there you get these cycles in that industry, which may not really tie up to what's really popular in pop music or whatever. There's be, whoever's hap- who's ever doing those jobs is finding that that's working really well for commercials. So right. it's a whole nother side of the business, and I think. I think the lesson, right, for any younger artists or people that are getting into it is like get your publishing in order. Understand what a PRO is. Understand that when you're writing music, you're creating intellectual property, which is just to say abstract ideas that don't exist that I'm like grabbing out of thin air. It's like, what is it? But you you made that music. You own it. And right. not only that, but there's multiple parts to it. There's different you know types of intellectual property inside a, inside a song. So a, a a week of studying that and watching blogs or, or you know YouTube videos or reading blogs about that and informing yourself really important. Totally. Even if you don't plan to do it, just having the knowledge around it so that you can speak somewhat intelligent about it right. if the opportunity comes to you. So yeah, um, so yeah, it's been you know, and some of that, like you said, some of that money has been really great and funded other creative projects, totally. and that that. Lessens it as a label. I think we're we're not the perfect fit for you know a ton of stuff, and like we're you know Monster Cat would be an electronic music label that just gets tons of video games, and they're sort of they have a whole division at that label just, just working on yeah. that, you know. And then some of the other people that I know that run labels, they do writer camps, and so they'll just go out with top line artists, singers, songwriters that have written music, and then they've got their producers. And then they're sort of like just writing for what they think is working now and creating music. And that's, you know, essentially, again, like in a division. We're not doing any of that. We're really staying true to just releasing music and supporting artists that we believe kind of fit that vision. And if, if and when there's some money or sinks that come through, that's great. Right, totally. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, I, th- I think it's, uh, it's still, still kind of a new world to me. Um, but it, it is... It is cool. Like it's good for artists to know exactly what you're saying. That yeah. There's another side to it. Yeah, it's a different kind of competition too. You're right. Like I actually try and avoid. I, I've had a lot of those same requests. Like, oh well, we want a whole album of this kind of stuff, and w- will you make that? And that is that is actually the kind of thing I'll usually turn down because I don't want to just like put my um, put a lot of work into a song that's going to go into a maybe pile. Yeah, I really. That bothers me a little bit. Yeah, spec and I ha- work is tough. I have done that. The kind of work I really like is the bespoke because mm-hmm. they they know what they want. They've got the reference. They trust me to get get them there. I'll take revisions. You know, no worries. Smart. We'll get there. Smart. But yeah, that that is the other side of it. Is like, yeah, when people are like, "Well, we want a bunch of stuff like this song. Will you make us three of those?" <laughs> yeah. Like that does feel a little like yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I have enjoyed the scoring side though too. I mean, like I went to school for music composition. That's like like orchestra and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's been cool to finally flex a little <laughs> on that side. And I am trying to do more film um, stuff. I just scored a short film. So, so I just all piano um, recently. Uh, he's doing the whole film festival thing. Cool. I'm, like submitting. So uh, waiting for that to come out, but wanting to do some more shorts and then, I don't know, I might try and get some cues on some features at some point. It's hard to keep all these balls, juggle yeah, all these balls, balls in balls. the air. Yeah. <laughs> I was, you had, at the beginning we had talked about, you had, you know, signed with some, you know, pretty, pretty high up there labels, I guess, how has that experience been and now has that, how has that informed how you want to run your label? Yeah, and I think that's one of the big shifts that's been happening for me is, yeah, and, and this is this is definitely a, well, I've got some kind of strong opinions about this and <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect everyone to agree with me, uh, but I think that any art, artistic en- endeavor, whatever kind of artist you are, if you try and play the stair step game, which I think everyone wants, mm-hmm. you're, you're trying to get, you, you make music you love, right? And you want more and more people to hear that. And so the way to do that is, and, and this is good general, <laughs> I think management advice, I, this I think you, you probably agree with me, is try and work with bigger artists and try and work with bigger labels. And as you do that, you expose uh, your music to larger audiences. And I think that that's great and it makes sense. 
it's difficult and there's stress involved. Um, and I, I did a lot of that and I think that worked pretty well for me for, uh, for a while. And then I kind of got a little stressed out with that game a little mm. bit. And I wanted to just do whatever I wanted to do and not worry about the stress of that. And I th I'm sure a lot of artists can also identify with that. Uh, I think you need to balance those things. I mean, you know, there's a, probably more artists than not that don't want to play that game. And then, unfortunately, a lot of people don't hear their music. So I think there's, there's value in pushing, whatever that pushing is. Um, I am really grateful for all the labels that I worked with. I think they, they all did a, a pretty good job. I do think like the bigger labels can, you can become a, like a cog in the wheel. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm also like not saying, oh, they, they suck. I think there's a reason for that. You know, they're, they've got a machine that they're running mm -hmm. and for their machine to keep running, they need to have regular releases and they'll allot whatever their budget is for each release. And that's, that's fine, that's kind of normal. That's the job of a label is to keep pushing things out regularly. But uh, yeah, doing it all for myself, it, it is just nice to have the freedom to do kind of what I want, when I want, where I want. So I kind of mentioned it very briefly earlier. Something weird we're doing, which is kind of weaving into our weird narrative stuff is, uh, so Conduit is like what we're saying our events are is like a window to another place. Mm. <laughs> and we'll explain what that other place is nice. down the road. But um, we also have this contraption, the conduit chaos contraption, <laughs> which sounds hilarious, but it's our way of dropping real weird random stuff. And uh, we only drop it for like a week or two weeks. And it's a collection of sometimes anonymous, so uh, music and or bootlegs or whatever, throw it up on Bandcamp or whatever. Uh, the bootlegs are all bonus tracks. Uh, like so there'll be surprise tracks that you get if you get the album and it's only up for a week or two and then it's gone Boop. you know i can't do that with a, a big label or something they'd be like the fuck you talking about yeah. <laughs> we, we're not gonna you know I'm definitely not gonna do that yeah um yeah and it's just cool to be like like my kind of general direction is i'm going a little more underground i'm going a little more weird i'm going a little more artsy um and i, I want my music to reflect that too i i've got uh I'm trying to go a lot more underground with the stuff that I will be releasing. Um, I'm like, and, and on that note, I'm really excited about what's happening in Garage and Breaks. Like, yeah, holy shit, man. Yeah, like, like, like I'm having students submit like house stuff to house labels, and they're like, we're looking for more Garage and Breaks right now. And I was like, I've been, you know, in the genre yeah. for a hot minute, <laughs> and it has been very not popular in the yeah. general sphere. Uh, and that it was really actually shifting, yeah. And that's crazy to me. Uh, so I'm pretty excited. I'm, I'm discovering so many new artists that are making breaks in garage, and it is awesome. Like I'm super hyped up about it. the The label itself is going to be. There'll definitely be breaks in garage, but we're a mix of electronica, some vibey stuff, some housey stuff, uh, maybe some drum and bass. Like my, my, I put out a couple of drum and bass tunes myself. So it's definitely going to be kind of eclectic. Uh, not, not anything like super heavy, uh, but, but yeah, I'm just really excited, man. Yeah, why do you think that that's happening right now? It's just, just, just cycles, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But it, it really is happening. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Who are you excited about? Any specific artists you want to mention? Oh, man. The ton. So many. I think spot. Bicep really drove a yeah. lot of this stuff trend from the UK, mm. but there's so much garagey stuff happening. You know, like Interplanetary Criminal is really crushing it. Artists I really am huge fans of right now, and they're not all, they're not huge, but they're people I really look up to is uh, Otik, or I, I don't you might pronounce it Otik, O-T-I-K, and Cameo Blush are two UK artists I really, really like right now. Boardlord is sick. She's out of the Bay, uh, Oakland, I think, specifically. Mm -hmm. She's doing really cool. It's like very stripped down, kind of uh, very purposely analog-y and not like overproduced, um, very like out of the machine kind of a sound and like very raw breaks, uh, very raw samples, which is like I spent my whole life trying to get like really produced sounding stuff and to see 
her music doing like really raw stuff like that mm. it's it's really exciting even glitch mob is yeah. doing a lot of breaks yeah. and stuff too um yeah speaking of that just so we talk about it, i just I sat with Uwa oh, from the Glitch Mob. Oh, amazing! And he gave me this tattoo, and you know they're they're launching their label, All the People. Yeah. And you know this was just literally just yesterday, and just talking about his excitement for some of this. You know, I thought yeah. your 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 album, Big Rave Energy, and they're really like going, they're championing this like rave sound. Yeah. You know the dark. And so it's cool to feel that kind of get back to what I would say our roots. Yeah. Right? So much is like you can only go so polished and so, and then it sort of becomes like the answer to that is basically punk rock. Yeah. You know, let's get raw again. Let's get real. Let's get just get dirty. And, and, and so it's exciting to see the trends go and new things pop up and, and new sounds and new people have a new opportunity, right? Like I've been in this sort of glitch and the bass world, the psychedelic bass world for a long time. And I don't feel like it's getting stale. I feel like there's still really talented artists, but I'm sort of excited for some a new movement. Yeah. Something that I'm really excited about, my, my wife turned me on this to, to this this genre is I'm a piano. Have you heard about this? I don't think so. So this is a is it's an offshoot of uh, Afro beat and and um, sorry sorry, Afro house and house music and it's 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 actually really difficult to DJ because it does not, it's not like a, a just typical 4-4. Four, four. Okay. It's usually sometimes like a triple kick on the one. Okay. And then it has this thing called a long drum. Anyways, it's, it is definitely an emerging genre that's coming, I believe, out of Nigeria, Africa. That's cool. And, and um, we went to, there's like one night in Austin where they're doing this. And I'll be honest and say like we were maybe one of three white people there which I think was great because yeah, Austin's awesome. a very white city. Totally. And we were like, whoa. And to see this, it was like, this is a new subculture. This is a merging subculture where people knew the songs, they were singing along. Yeah. I have, you know, I had dove into it, but I didn't know, you know the words so well. And it was just it was so cool to see how passionate people were about this. And that's kind of, I look back on the, you know, 2000. You know, seven, eight, nine of drum and bass when the UK sound came to America, and we all sort of discovered it and got to have that moment with it. it. Was like, what is this? This is new. This is you know. So I saw that, and then as we were leaving, which this is maybe not as as new, but there were all the, we were at Empire Auto Garage, and so we we're in the garage, which was where the Ama, Ama Piano Night was. And then as we walked, uh, we were going home. We were leaving. There was an emo night. In the in the control room, and it was like kids, probably fourteen to eighteen years old. There was no DJ, there was no performer. It was just all of them listening to emo music, <laughs> screaming along and playing air guitar. And I was like, "Whoa, there's a whole nother subculture." Oh, yeah, totally. So I got like two for one in one night, and I was I I was like, "Man, what a what a trip! Yeah, like, what a cool thing to discover!" Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. That I had a kind of not quite the same thing, but I, I also just just speaking about culture, I had a realization the other day. I was like, I've been doing it a long time, and you, sometimes you forget. You're like, we're we're part of a culture where we just start having people dance. You know, <laughs> like that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like we're just like making music for people to dance that's to. That's it. And, like dancing is such a cool culture. I mean, yeah. my wife has also turned me on to like all. So many cool things that, but but just dancing, you know, like yeah, I'm, being in the bass music scene. I'm sure I've done this, you know, yeah, <laughs> quite a few times. But dancing is an expression of being alive and being human. Yeah, and that's it's badass, you know. Yeah. So just having that realization, I was like, I haven't really thought about that idea in a while. Like, right, just doing stuff because we love the culture, we love the music, and we mm. want people to dance. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and uh, I was talking about this last night. Um, I recently, I think it was an Andrew Huberman podcast, he was talking about different types of meditation. And so he was saying, like, for some people, they really need this inward meditation. For me, I'm very extroverted. So if I'm sitting, being quiet, bringing my focus inward, that really helps me find my balance. My wife is pretty introverted. And so for her, like, her meditation is really a physical meditation of yoga. And that balances her the other way. It kind of gets her out of her head, okay. makes her less you know the thought loops and things and and so uh, i think dancing is absolutely one of those ways where you can really just you know and you see communities like ecstatic dance 
where it's just like you're being coached to just be as free and let go as much as you can and just really tap into like the, the moment. What does this music, what does that sound make me feel like I want to do with my body? And it gets you out of your, you know, out of your head and really tuning into your body, which I think is, is wonderful. Wow, man, what a, what a great chat. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of wrap this up and say, like, what are you really excited about this year? What do you got coming up? I know we talked about a ton of stuff. So, yeah, what's, what's up? What's going on next? Totally, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm all in on Conduit. Like, that's easily the, the big thing. And we're working on events uh, in different cities. We've already done Texas, San Francisco, and L.A. We've got another one in San Francisco coming up uh, soon, beginning of March. And uh, also working on Denver. Maybe we'll get to Austin at some nice. point too. Uh, but yeah, in addition to all of that stuff, we're, you know, I'm I'm trying to develop the film stuff. So we're going to be filming more of the sets. And I I finally <laughs> <laughs> I finally bought decks, dude. I haven't I haven't had CDJs in like a long time. Uh, so I'll be doing some more uh, filming at home probably too cool. with the decks. And um, I'm just. I'm also working on the stuff I'm really excited about is I'm also trying to learn touch designer and doing some like installation art stuff that's interactive. Of course we do that with the events. Um, but yeah, I'm just excited for all the new music coming out. I'm excited for these like shifts in the music world that's happening. And uh, yeah, I'm ready. Like, let's go. I'm, let's I'm go. into it. I'm excited. Well, I know for a fact whatever you put your hand to is going to be quality. It's going to be excellent. I'm so glad we got to sit down and chat today. Yeah, I wish you all the luck, man, and I'm excited to see where this year and the next come for yeah. you. Thanks, man. This yeah. was awesome. All right. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers.